Welcome to this River Publishers discussion. I'm Philippa Jeffries and today I'm with Rajiv Prasad, also from River Publishers, and we are talking to Fred Harris about his career in signal processing and the Hi. success of his book, Multi-Rate Signal Processing for Communication Systems, which um, I believe has been one of our best sellers the last couple of years. Um, so welcome, Fred. Thank you so much for joining us. And again, congratulations on the success of your book. Why, thank you. It's fun um, to share the book <laughs> with the readers which is the mm -hmm. reason that we write books. <laughs> yeah, and it's a couple of years ago when the book came out, um, we did an interview together where we talked a bit about um, the book specifically, but um, today I was wondering if you perhaps could start by talking a little bit about how you got started in signal processing and your kind of research and career from then on. Okay, I can do that. Many, many <laughs> years ago when I first got out of college and I went to work in industry, we had uh, we were building rocket engines in Sacramento to go to the okay. moon, and we had some noise that was in the data collection that we were monitoring the behavior of the rocket engines, and we had to suppress the noise so we could see the underlying signal. And mm -hmm. I started using computers to suppress the noise. And one of my mentors came to me and said, Fred, why are you doing digital signal processing? He said, all you can do with DSP is process audio, and why would you want to do that? So that was mm -hmm. my advice, which was bad advice, incidentally, <laughs> given to me by a mentor, which I'm glad I ignored, because <laughs> it was true. In the early days, all you could do is process audio. And mm -hmm. the community that first absorbed and fell in love with signal processing was sonar because it was an audio problem. And then we got involved in processing speech and music for communications and entertainment. And then as technology advanced, now instead of having 20 kilohertz A to D converters, we now have gigahertz A to D converters. And we swallow tens of gigahertz worth of bandwidth and still do the same processing, but at a much higher speed. Now, I had a student many, many years ago who I worked with one summer between semesters. And then we met again the following summer and we worked together. And the student said, Fred, you know, there's a new discipline coming across the horizon. And it would be fun if you put together a course called Digital Signal Processing. <laughs> So based upon the student's request, that's what I did. I started writing notes, handwritten notes. We didn't have Xerox machines. These were mimeographed handwritten notes. And of course, all the people watching this will not know what a mimeograph machine <laughs> is, but you and I may remember it. And then I was teaching the course as I was generating the notes at the Navy lab in San Diego. They had an interest in uh, audio processing for sonar. Mm -hmm. And I remember one of the publishers at the Navy lab complained to the captain of the Navy lab saying, this fellow is charging us to teach a course in signal processing, but we invented that here. And, and didn't we invent <laughs> the Fourier transform? And the, we had to explain to her, no, you didn't invent the Fourier <laughs> transform. <laughs> All we're doing is explaining what it is so you'll understand uh -huh. it, but it, it came elsewhere. So it was fun to see the early days when people were learning a new discipline totally outside their normal experience. Mm -hmm. And technology and the computer and integrated circuits all contributed to bringing up the technology to the spot in which we, uh, we now use it. And it's in this, it's it's you can't build a product without signal processing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And the the one example I use, I had to replace my oven recently because the microprocessor in the oven died. I couldn't get the replacement for it. Okay. <laughs> you can't cook a meal without signal processing. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's the most important application. That's right. <laughs> a quick question, if I may. And uh, so the early days when you started teaching the course on DSP, uh, these the students were, uh, what year were they at the university? Were these undergrads? This is 19, 1967. 
I first started teaching it as an undergraduate course, so it was way beyond the student's ability. So I had to move it into a graduate course. So I started it as a graduate course when it started having uh, a great deal of attention. And even though it started as a graduate course, in most schools, it's now a junior level class because it's really? gone down, down, down as to a core course, which is as important to STEM as mathematics and uh, chemistry mm -hmm. and physics is, it has long shelf life and will be with us forever. Absolutely. So the reason I asked actually, and you pretty much uh, preempted my next question, um, <laughs> as it has become more and more fundamental, do you see that education in DSP or to a certain degree uh, should be brought into courses in high school? And the reason I ask, and this sort of relates to recently I've had conversations with my with my friends who are who are engineers uh, working with in semiconductor industry or in the biotech industry, and they related they have related stories where they have hired interns from high school, and they were amazed at their knowledge as opposed to when my generation, which is, I'm 46, <laughs> when we were, we were that age at, in high school, we certainly did not have that kind of grasp of technology. And my son and my friend's children who are in high school, they're working with robotics. They, they are aware of working in biotechnologies to a certain degree, at least in the US. And so I'm just wondering, does, elements of DSP seeps into education uh, in grade 12, grade 11? It sort of does, partly because of the ubiquity of computers. Everyone has mm -hmm. a computer. And if you have a computer, there are very simple things you can ask the computer to do. And when I introduced DSP, I said, you've been doing this since the third grade. And what we do in the third grade is we generate something called your grade point average. You say ah, an A is worth four points, and a B is worth three points, and a C is worth two points. And what you do, you take a running weighted average of your grades to find your average grade. Mm -hmm. And you do the averaging to find there's a mean and there's a variation around the mean. And when we give grades, we have to estimate those parameters, and we do it with signal processing of all the strange things. And and when I start teaching convolution now, again, everyone who's interested in what we're talking about knows what convolution is. Um, convolution is something that you could teach a third grade student. Now, in fact, we do teach a third grade student convolution, but we don't call it convolution. Mm -hmm. We call it longhand multiplication. And it works out longhand multiplication and convolution are identically the same algorithm. And I jokingly tell the students that the teacher says, we're going to learn a grown-up thing today in class, and you <laughs> take it home and show your parents. We're going to teach you how to do convolution. And there's no third grade class that ever did that. But if you change the word convolution to multiplication, it would have been exactly the same lecture. And I actually give that lecture that if I multiply two numbers, I'm actually convolving the sequences. It's a wonderful little demonstration. And in fact, because multiplication and convolution are the same, if you wanted to compute pi to a million decimal places, mm -hmm. you need a million decimal places numbers to do that arithmetic. And most computers don't know how to multiply a million decimal place numbers. So what we do is we take the Fourier transform of the first number, the Fourier mm -hmm. transform of the second number, take the product of the Fourier transform, do the inverse transform, and lo and behold, you just convolve two million digit numbers using Fourier transforms. Every supercomputer in the world knows how to do that. <laughs> and then I point out, you know, we're doing third grade stuff in this class, so don't, don't trip over your, your feet thinking this stuff is hard. All right, that, that that answers that question. So it has seeped <laughs> in a, a much, yeah, much uh, all the way to the third grade math, not just the high school. But I suppose right. uh, I suppose there's there's uh, there's a lot more uh, 
uh, just to stay on this topic a little bit longer, I, I think there's a lot more effort being made by schoolings, at least what I observe here in the US again, is to bring uh, students, make them more aware of the applications of various technologies, right? Uh, as opposed to, again, when when I was a high schooler. Um, so yeah, uh, so it'll be interesting to see how one day DSP is a course that a high schooler could actually literally choose as an elective. <laughs> well, again, it's because of the computer. It's easy to teach programming. And, and in fact, mm -hmm. we had uh, one of our faculty taught a summer class a couple of years ago to underprivileged, uh, underrepresented students. And he thought this was going to be a disaster. They don't have the skills. They don't have the, the preparation. He said they were as good as any of the students he ever had. All you had to do is motivate them. And mm -hmm. the computer does a wonderful job because they get immediate feedback. They conduct an experiment, and they know the answer. And they learn from the answer. And they get to be as good as any of his normal students in the college. And these are all the high school kids. Yeah, so the computer is uh, is a mind changing uh, experience which connects you to the understanding of abstract concepts and right brain visualizations of those contract uh, con uh, concepts. Kind of continuing on this line of education okay. and kind of methods of education, I just want to kind of direct it um, to your experiences in publishing and publishing books and back to um, your your book, The Multi-Rate Signal Processing for Communication Systems that we published. Um, how important uh, do you think is publishing books like this and making these available uh, within this kind of research area? Well, what happens, you generate information and what you want to do is share it with people. Mm -hmm. And when you share it with people, you, you're proud of the fact that, look what I did. And I think you have a, as much fun playing with it as I do. And yeah. that's been my experience. If you write in a certain way, which invites people, we call it the royal approach to writing. Let us do this. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't like the royal way. It sounds like it's non-technical, but I love it. I want the students to come with me on the journey that I have taken mm -hmm. to experience and understand some very sophisticated ideas, things which they would not be able to do if the book wasn't there. Mm -hmm. Papers are written to introduce the material very quickly but papers always have restricted number of pages. Mm -hmm. And the common wisdom when you're writing papers is nobody understands them mm -hmm. because you've shortened them so much to satisfy the page limit, you've left out the core of the understanding. The only people who understand the papers are people who wrote the papers, but not the people who are the readers of the papers. So the book gives you more space. It mm -hmm. gives you a larger horizon. It gives you room to play, room to invite you to. In fact, when I tell students, the, the best thing you can do when you're learning this material is play with it. Take what you've got and see what mm -hmm. happens if you turn this knob, what changes? And then turn that knob and see what changes. And the kids and young people who do that become better engineers. Yeah because they played and it made fun out of the learning process. One of my famous quotes, which I put in a, a lot of my papers is, if you're not having fun, you're probably not doing it right. And I think that's true. Um, my, the book incidentally is getting wide distribution everywhere I go. Uh, for instance, mm -hmm. I did a, 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 um, a two hour presentation at Elfrey Harris recently. And they invited uh, 21 students who were working at the company to attend my presentation. Mm -hmm. Every one of them was one of my former students. I think that's how they did it. Right. And what they did, they ordered 21 copies of the book and had me sign each copy and give it to each student. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I thought that was a nice compliment, both mm -hmm. to the student and to me. 
and and the students did you remember my saying if you're not having fun you're not doing it right <laughs> how does it feel to get kind of that response to you to your book and know that it's kind of helping those kinds oh, of people it's wonderful uh, it means that they're doing their job mm -hmm. they're learning the material which is what i'm supposed to do help them learn the material uh, years and years ago, I had a company um, up in Irvine called Stanford Telecom asked me to build a channelizer for them. And they gave me all the specs. And the guy who gave me the specs said, can you do that? And I said, yes, I think I can do that. And when I was saying that, I had a little vision of a little man sitting on my shoulder, whispering in my ear, saying, Fred, You've never done that. You just told the man you can do that. <laughs> well, I was pretty sure I could do it because mm -hmm. I understood the problem. Mm -hmm. And I went home that weekend from Irvine back to San Diego. And I spent the entire weekend talking to myself in an empty classroom on a big whiteboard. And on Monday, I sent him the solution. That guy thinks I'm the smartest man he ever met. <laughs> because I converted the problem he thought was not doable Mm -hmm. into a weekend's uh, uh, task, <laughs> and he then wrote a, a very, very nice things about me and my material. Mm -hmm. That's interesting that you said that you may not know the solution, but you understood the problem initially, and that That's was right. the first right. step. That's right. And one of the things I do, I point out what we do in this body and material, we point out that one of the things you learned is that aliasing is mm -hmm. alias and means to travel under a false name. Mm -hmm. When you have certain signals and you violate you know, certain operating conditions, the signal appears to be a different signal. Mm -hmm. So you're taught very early to avoid that uh, condition because you don't want the signal to appear to be something else. Mm -hmm. The thing I teach is, no, 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 that, don't, don't do that. It's okay if the signal appears to be somewhere else, you can alias a signal, then you can unalias a signal as part of the mm -hmm. processing. People say you can't unalias a signal. In <laughs> fact, they say, Fred, you know, you must be working too hard. Go home, get some <laughs> rest. Come back mm -hmm. tomorrow and we'll continue this discussion. <laughs> and then when they see that it actually works, they say, why didn't they tell me that? I said, because you've been given wrong information at the beginning. We, right. we, were, we had the wrong impression of what alias did and does mm -hmm. and if you do it right you can do amazing things which are way beyond the capability of normal signal processing and that's what attracts people and in fact th there's a blog online called dsp i wrote it down um, uh, dsp related and mm -hmm. someone puts problems up on these on the blog and often there are students asking for help in their homework problems yeah so i try not to answer those questions <laughs> but but some of them are by other faculty who are asking questions mm -hmm. and the question was i've got a hundred megahertz sample rate and i've got a one kilohertz wide signal and i want to mm -hmm. build a simple filter and all the answers were wrong they were just addressing the problem the incorrect way and the filter needed 800 taps running at 100 kilohertz. So I said, guys, you're doing this wrong. Don't do that. You never want to have a large ratio of sample rate to bandwidth because it's an ill-conditioned problem. Mm -hmm. Improve the condition number by lowering the sample rate and then solve the problem with a lower sample rate. And what I did is I wrote a piece of code and put it up online. That's what I did all week it took me to do that. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to write a paper on it because it was such a nice solution. Uh, I can do it with eight multiplies and adds instead of 800 multiplies and add by lowering the sample rate, solving the problem with a low sample rate, then raising the sample rate again. Hmm. So it, that's what that's what you learn in the multi-rate signal processing. You can change the, mm -hmm. the one of the tools you have, which you don't normally have in signal processing, is sample rate as a variable. And modern signal processing and modern communications relies quite heavily on our ability to change the sample rate mm -hmm. in a receiver or a transmitter. It's the great flexibility of modern communications. Okay, that's fantastic that there's still yeah, so much going on, so much people are still learning about this area. That's right. 
Yeah, and I get I get these nice compliments when I put these answers on. Mm-hmm. They say, "Oh, it's nice to meet you, even though it's not in person." I've yeah. always admired your work, and I I should write these things down. So, <laughs> <laughs> but I always thank them for a nice compliment. <laughs> Yeah, In fact, um, I did a little job for for um, uh, Amazon. They had okay. built a satellite, uh-huh. and the satellite uh, had a, um, a a multi-rate filter on it, but it was using too much power, and they couldn't get the eat off bird of the satellite. Okay. So they asked me, could I use my tricks to improve the performance of their design? Mm-hmm. And I redesigned it using my techniques. And mm-hmm. we reduced the power by 90%. And, it now oh, wow. is fl- and now there should be 3,000 of these flying around the world somewhere. And I wrote a paper at a con- for a conference, and I couldn't use the numbers I had in Amazon because those are sort of private. Mm-hmm. So I, I made a make-believe problem. Mm-hmm. And the make-believe problem had all the complexity and difficulty of the original problem with different numbers in it. Mm-hmm. And it got the best paper award at the conference because people oh, said, "Oh, that's an interesting approach." Yeah, you you can reduce the power if you come to it with a different approach, mm-hmm. and we did. Great, and that goes back to what you're saying about how it's still very much about playing around with it and having fun and trying different things. The, the playing with it, that's right. Right. Great. Um, I'm really sorry we're kind of coming to the end of our time, but um, I just okay. want to finish with one more question, which is, okay. um, do you have any plans for any more books that we can look forward to? Well, I have plans. I, I need to write a book on uh, synchronization. Okay. Um, one of the things we do is we embed the multi-rate signal processing in radios. And mm-hmm. we do it because we want to be able to change sampler rate. And when you change sample rate, you have to be able to figure out, well, what should it be and what is mm-hmm. it? And how do you make the changes? We do it for our time and recovery and phase recovery and phase lock loops. You're always changing clocks. And it's the great flexibility that you can pick one sample rate at the input of the receiver. And once you get inside the receiver, change it to what it has to be for the signal you're processing. Mm-hmm. That great flexibility change forever how we build radios. Software-defined radios rely upon the fact sample rate is a continuously variable Mm -hmm. parameter, and we do it well. And in fact, that's sort of the back end of the book shows Mm -hmm. what you can do with sample rate changes when you build receivers and modulators. And, and, And then the the new place where we're spending a lot of effort and activity is mm-hmm. we're putting up lots of low Earth orbit satellites. Yeah. We're looking at Amazon. We're looking at SpaceX. Mm-hmm. We're, we're putting up 10,000 satellites. And they're all in low Earth orbit because we want to make them inexpensive and easy to mm-hmm. launch and easy to control. But because they're in low Earth orbit, they're moving very rapidly. Mm-hmm. And because they move rapidly, there's a significant Doppler shift. So now oh, what we're cool. doing, we're adding another parameter into the design. How do you remove the unknown Doppler shift? Mm-hmm. Or how do you estimate and then remove it? Yeah. And it's it's another layer of, look how well we do this job. We're so good at it. Um that's fantastic and, that you see it from that point of view, because I was just thinking, oh, that's another complexity to the problem. But you're thinking, no, this is great. <laughs> yeah, it, it adds more fun to the problem. Look, I've, I've done another one. <laughs> <laughs> great. Well, thank you so much for joining us, friend. Um, Rajiv, perhaps would you like to finish with some words on the book and the series we have in Signal Image and Speech Processing? Absolutely. Thank you again, Fred. Uh, and again, congratulations on the publication. This is almost the second year of the publication mm-hmm. of the multi-rate book. Um, uh, I just wanted to, uh, in the closing, mention that we are looking into the possibility of doing uh, publishing something along the lines of a short overview books, which addresses hot topics. Uh, these are authored, um, and we call them River Rapids. And uh, certainly, this is something we have dis- uh, we have discussed with Fred and mm-hmm. our series editors as well. And so, look out for. Uh, mm-hmm short books along with the collections that we already have made with the synchronization one's the first <laughs> okay uh-huh. <laughs>
Great. Well, thank you so much, okay, both of you, for joining me, Fred especially. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for listening.